Hi, and welcome to number 14 of Young at Harp. I'm Deborah Henson Conant, and this is Kathleen Wiley. I'll tell you why we're here in a second, and today we're going to talk about flow, going with the flow or fluency. <laughs> And um, so Kathleen is a Jungian analyst, and I am a composer and a performer. And we're looking at all these ideas through two different lenses. One is the lens of music and my principles of music, which I call the strings of passion. And Kathleen is helping us to see that through the lens of the groundbreaking psychoanalyst, Carl Jung. So do I have that right? You got that right. Perfect. Okay. So uh, th what brought this up for me today is that I was struggling sort of getting from point A to point B and feeling like I was getting distracted by things. And, um, and then I had to put on my cell phone and I had to find my earphones and I was able to because I had just set up a system where it was very easy, where I always put them back. And I, and I was struck by that. I was like, wow, that worked. That was different. I didn't have to go looking around the house for a pair that I hadn't stepped on yet. And so I thought about what is keeping me from fluency, or from that feeling of fluency in my life? What's keeping me from feeling like I can go in a straight line? So I stopped and I thought about that for a minute. And what came to me is, if you can't go in a straight line, it's because there are things in the way. So I wanted to bring that to Kathleen to talk about today. Yes, and as you're talking, you know, part of what occurs to me is that when we think of a straight line, we always think of that flat line that we all drew in those young math classes. But if we look at the arc of a circle, it also is a line. It's a <laughs> curved line. <laughs> okay. It's not, oh. and, and so this idea of a straight line as being superior mm. isn't... Um, always the case and there are moments where straight lines like every time I take my earbuds out of my ear I put them in this one place so that you always know where to go get them those kinds of straight lines create habit patterns or routines that just make it easier to live our lives because let's face it with everything we do during the day if we had to stop and recreate everything and go in the arc, the curved line, um, we take it would take a lot of energy. But there are times where we need the curved line because that's part of the process of creating. So I think part of it, if we're going to talk about fluency and flow, is we've got to make room for the straight line and the curved line for the circle that becomes the spiral where you're always moving forward as well as that straight line where it's like the torpedo movement forward and that there's a time and place for both well you're reminding me of something that a therapist of mine said to me years ago and i'm still working on it he said you know everything doesn't have to be creative <laughs> Meaning what you just said, yeah. which is the habits that support us and that support our creativity don't have to be creative in themselves. Right. And, and in fact, I'm thinking, so I did a, um, I'm now doing these jams twice a week where people are meeting me online. Um, we're mm. in the midst of this you know, pandemic and, and it's just a way for people to connect. And I set up grooves on my harp and then people play along to them. And, um, and afterwards, I asked what people's takeaways were. People are just playing, playing along. And, and one person said, um, well, I love that you set up this structure because then I can be really free. I don't know. My computer just decided to start. I, that's what that okay. sound was. Um, and he said, so he said that structure, how the, the, the structure of it is helping me to be with you. And then one other person said, I'm having trouble understanding the whole structure. And so I'm getting lost. And so, and, and to her and to him, I said, great, that's great that you're seeing that. And to her, I said, actually, you're trying to see a structure you don't need to see, or you're trying to play a structure you don't need to play right now. I'm telling you that you can literally play any note from here to here, and you can play around with it, and I'm giving you the structure. And so I realized that if we feel the structure or the groove, we can go with it. If we're trying to understand something at a greater level than we 
can or we need to in the moment, we actually need to let go and surrender and allow the groove to take us. And that I would say is going with the flow, whether I understand mm -hmm. that flow or not. It's allowing that I don't have to understand it. I just can go with it. Right. That's similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, the image that came to my mind as you were talking is like, um, again, if, you, if we took the compass to draw the circle, there is a straight line between the point of the compass and the pencil that's moving to draw the circle. But the curved line that creates the arc of the circle has many different places. And so that's what you were saying to the person who said, um, was having difficulty with the structure and you said, well, just play one note. You're trying to see something. You were encouraging her, just be wherever you want on that arc of the circle. You're still connected to the structure, the center point, the groove you had Whoa. set up. This is so powerful. Okay, go on. <laughs> yeah, and, and that that's equally as valid and beautiful an expression and life-giving, forward-moving an expression as the straight line. Wow. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm seeing and what you're saying now is mm -hmm. the straight line, the straight line is in a sense, an externally imposed straight line. If I have a straight line between me and, and something else, and I keep that, it is, that line is still there and, and I'm connected to it and I'm grounded to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And this is something else that I've been thinking of this week is about groundedness and that I, I, I don't know if I'm going far afield or if I'm in a field, but I'll show this, I'll share okay. this. I thought groundedness was, I need to be like a tree, I'm in one place, my roots go down and that's groundedness. But suddenly I thought about what it means to have gravity and what it means to be a planet. And I, I, I thought of it in terms of a story like, what if I was a satellite that wanted to be a planet, but I had no gravity? So I just had to, you know, any planet that comes along, I just have to go and circle around it because I have no gravity. How would I stop being a satellite and get my own really powerful center of gravity? And how would I strengthen that center of gravity? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I mean, my first answer was like, well, eat a lot of potatoes and you'll weigh more and then you'll have more gravity. But I, I know that that's not really, I mean, first of all- I think the root vegetables are always a good idea for getting grounded. <laughs> right. Potatoes, beets, carrots. You know. um, so, uh, so, so how do we, I, I don't even know, I feel like we're going on to another subject, but I, I'm gonna trust that it's gonna come back. How do we, how do we get that center of gravity within ourselves? Which doesn't mean that we can't interact with other planets or other things that have gravity, but how do we, uh, is this even a- No, I, I'm, I'm right with you. And I do think it fits with what we're talking about. So as I'm listening, there are two or three things coming to mind. And one is, and, and I might not get this exactly right, so you Gurdjieff um, experts, you go, you go to fact check me. But Gurdjieff, who was a contemporary of Jung and um, developed a spiritual philosophy, he was in, um, I believe in Great Britain. He said that um, in terms of spiritual consciousness, we are all like, um, I believe he said it, we're all like, um, moons that are trying to become stars that are trying to become suns right and exactly yeah and psychologically what i would say from Jung's psychology is that when the sun is equivalent to a sense of self that is connected to the whole of who we are which includes all we don't know about ourselves Whereas often like the satellite, when we're like the satellite or the moon, it's like we're in the ego or persona or we're just reflecting whatever it is that's coming at us. Right. Because if we're a moon, we don't even, we have our own light. We're only the reflection of the sun. Right. If we're a planet. We're circling the sun, you know, so, um, so we're a satellite with a satellite. Um, wow. So. So what did he say about like how we do that? 
Well, it really has to do with an expansion of consciousness and a widening of one's sense of self. You know, so for instance, we've just widened this idea that you have to go straight line to straight line, or there's an obstacle that's a problem, to say, wait a minute, yeah, sometimes that may be true, but other times what you need and what may seem to be the obstacle is a very important life-giving step on the arc of the circle. And that there are different ways to move forward. So we just together widened our consciousness, thus allowing you, allowing me and whomever is listening to make more room for different kinds of experiencing and different ways of moving forward in our lives whether it's moving forward, letting go of emotional state, it's moving forward toward a project we want to do, or it's moving forward to say, you know, this is a straight plus straight line would help, or this is the place where that curve would help. And I can kind of bounce around the different points on the arc of the line. Well, you're making me think also, I mean, we're, we're recording this in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. And I know that crisis often creates innovation mm -hmm. that would not happen without that crisis. I know that World War II is because of World War II that many things that we have today were developed because they had to be developed. And I'm observing that the infrastructure of the country as well as my infrastructure is not supporting me. I haven't set that up. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, that's why I'm having trouble going in a straight line. Same with you know, during, during an, um, a, 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 a catastrophe or a pandemic or a crisis, when you don't, when you haven't set up the system for it, then you're constantly having to dodge and then find things and, and pull. And yet, what you just said is that crisis itself gives us the clarity and the sense of urgency to start creating that infrastructure that will support our ability to respond more creatively and more effectively later on. Absolutely. And uh, absolutely. And if you think about it, if we go back and I'm visioning in my head, and if I had my whiteboard, I'd draw it. Here we've got the point of the circle. So that's the point. And then we're drawing the radius. So you're wanting to go from the outside of the circle to this point but you start on this part of the circle and there's a block, you can't get there. But you move on up around an inch or two and you can, the flow is there. So the other thing we have to do is realize where are the structures, what are the straight lines that are the problem? And where are the structures where there is a flow of energy, i.e. where things move toward the point we want, that there that support it i mean crisis shows as you've just said where there are the weak spots in our own structure internally where for me and what that means psychologically is that there is a lack of conscious ability to move from the conscious self to the larger self which is unconscious in other words we we either freeze right. or we flee from what we're feeling or we go into fight mode versus moving towards the unknown of what's becoming known vis-a-vis -vis the negative feeling state or vis-a-vis -vis the problem vis-a-vis -vis something that we're trying to resolve no so fight flight or freeze are definitely body states and states of consciousness that do block the flow of energy on the straight line as well as the arc of the, the, the curve line. Well, as you were talking about that curved line and you said, you know, the straight line might not exist here, but right. it exists over here. And I suddenly thought, that's why we have to keep moving. And that's, yeah. why, and, and that's why in music, a groove will keep you moving and allows you to surrender and still be with it. Yes. And then on a personal level, I thought, if I'm stumbling over the things I'm keeping true from the past that are no longer need to be true for me, how can I 
where do I, if I'm taking them with me so that, you know, they're right here and it's going, <laughs> so they're always there. How do I leave them behind? Well, you can't because they're part of your history. But what you can do is build a different relationship to them. You can move on around the arc of a circle where you have the view that says, wow, there's that old historical response, but you know what? I'm not for anymore. And let me ground myself in the reality of myself as an adult and all the resources I have now. So you can't leave it behind, but you can build a different relationship to it, which is really what if you think about the circle that by the way is a symbol of the larger self for Jung. Right. And, and that if you think about that, then you can have different relationships based on where you are in your sense of self. Now, you just said something. I'm, I'm preoccupied by it. You okay. said ground yourself, if, ground yourself in, I, th I think you said something like in, in where you are now. Or, or yes. How do you do that? How do you ground yourself in a, a new reality? Yeah. So the the most simple thing is you take your socks and shoes off and you stand in the center of the room <laughs> and you say, um, I, you know, I would say I'm Kathleen Wiley and today is April 3rd, 2020. And here I am in my home office in North Carolina and um, I'm looking outside and I'm seeing the beautiful dogwood trees blooming and, oh, I just saw this woodpecker land. We literally come back into our body sensory experience in the moment. Wow, that's like a captain's log, like captain's log. Yes, you know, yes. Eye, Sitting in a spaceship, Deborah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and once we do that, it's amazing how that seemingly simple exercise will shift your consciousness. Then let's just say you're caught in an old fear as a lot of people are now, caught in early fears that the current situation is just a perfect projection screen for. And yes, there are things we have to be tending to about the present reality, but tending to them and what's in the present reality, grounded in the present reality, results in one set of experiences, whereas tending to the things that need to be tended to now through the filter of past historical fears is a totally different thing. Can you say that again? Because I was writing down the words tending to it. Yeah, that tending to a present threat based on the realities of the present threat is one thing. Tending to a present threat through the filters and the emotional colored glasses of past threats where we were powerless and helpless and dependent as and alone, and children yeah. and alone are two totally different experiences. So part of what we have to do in reality is we really have to, once we get ourselves back in our own embodied body, is we then have to say, okay, what is it that I know is true about this situation? What is the outer reality? And we really have to look to what is it we know, not what we think, not what we're being told, you know, not all the colorful stories, but what do we know? And what do we know about our own historical experiences and historical self that's activated? Like, you know, I'm certain, and I know sometimes when my early anxiety gets triggered. How you do know, you know? Uh, how can you tell? I feel it. It's got this old familiar flavor. It's like, oh, here's that old friend. Uh-huh. Here's that. And, and one of my early fears has to do with stepping out and being and expanding and doing more publicly. And so I've just kind of started laughing when I do something that's the next step. Here comes this wave of anxiety and I'll have all these crazy catastrophic thoughts and fantasies. And I just chuckle and say, there's my old friend. Of course it's showing up now because I just took this step out that goes against how I, how I psychologically survived as a child. And it frees me from it. I can just have compassion for myself, you know? Well, yes, you have, that's excellent. I mean, I love that you have that, you have that ability to make the distinctions. 
Yes. And the differentiation, obviously, you know, this is what you've been spending your life learning to do. So for those of us who may not, who, 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 who are still being like, thinking like, oh, that's, that's a surprise. Like for the 2000th time, that's a surprise. <laughs> that's just, um, what, well, I think what you, I mean, what you just said, this whole idea of captain's log, you know, star date, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, that's interesting because that I think would get me more aware mm-hmm. and would be fun. Um, what, um, what could we add, or is, if that's what you would suggest, like if coming out of this session, that's what you suggest, what would be something that might help us specifically look for, um, you know, like if, if I was, if I was a spaceship, I'm like looking for, you know, past thing is, or, you know, and the, the, the pasties or whatever, I don't know, how would I look for them? You, we always know that when that's triggered because we are having an emotional response that's over the top. Well, how do I know it's over the top? I mean, I mean, I'm dramatic. Uh, My life is (laughs) drama. Well, we, we're having an emotional response that interferes with our ability to think beyond the straight line. Uh Aha. So that if we're having an emotional response that does not allow us to entertain other points of view, that does not let us have a constructive dialogue with ourselves, where there's more than one possibility, then chances are we are caught in a historical energy system. A historical energy system. Right. Scott. And Jung had the word complex. He called that a complex. And it's why did like he call a, it that? Well, I don't really know why he picked that word, except complex is our complex. Well, that's what I'm <laughs> They're multi layered. But it's not just one thing, and it, it's right. not compound. It's not just one thing, and here's right. another thing. Here's a fear, here's a past. Right. It's like, here's a, here's a fear past. Here's a fear past that presents itself as your future, right? Right, right. Yes. And, and you know, often people have arguments with intimate partners, and then three days later, they don't even remember what the argument was about. And part of what's happened is they've gotten triggered into an old historical energy center, a complex. So all of a sudden, they're arguing about something that isn't at all the issue that they started the argument, that started the argument. Yeah, you're shaking your head. You know what I mean. Probably everybody watching knows what I mean. Right. We had those arguments with intimate partners, with parents, with, with children. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm aware of that getting lost into some, you know, it's like Netflix of the mind. It's like this, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, you know, yeah. soap opera yeah. of the mind, and you're and you're in there, and then, yeah, uh, and then and and that's right. That that will catch me. Yeah, and I want to circle back to your question about how do you do that yeah. if you haven't done the years of analysis that I've, I've done because that's my, my life's work. Um, I think, again, we have to have the capacity for self-reflection. So anything that you can do that cultivates the ability to have self-reflection, so like stream of consciousness journaling, mm-hmm. the captain's log we just mm-hmm. talked about, any kind of body awareness exercises, um, the active imagination we've talked about before where you dialogue with a part of yourself and you listen. Right. Um, these tools are great. A couple of really good books, um, Negotiating the Inner Peace Treaty by Chelsea Wakefield is a great book. Um, Compassion and Self-Hate by Theodore Rubin is a great book. Both of those use, use a similar analogy that um, I use, which is whenever these energy states, these feelings or these strong fantasies or beliefs come up that have a lot of emotion, if we can just invite it into the conference room of our heart, hear what it has to say, and then let it hear from the other parts of us that are in the conference room of our heart. So that, again, we begin to realize at any one moment in time, there is so much more to who we are than one state of consciousness with its feelings and beliefs and ideas and images and fantasies. So I'm hearing we are not a straight line. We are not. In fact, Jung said we, we are a complexio oppositorium. We are a complex of opposites. We have all kinds of energies inside of us that often are 
opposing energies. Right. Yeah. Like the part of me that wants to hide in the woods and the part of me that wants to do the work we're doing. Right, right. <laughs> they, they coexist. My hermit healer woman is here screaming right now. What the right. hell are you doing? <laughs> right. Uh, I would love to talk about that, um, actually. <laughs> and um, and uh, as you were talking, I was thinking, so how can we do this with music? You know, musicians or even non-musicians. And I realized that the, um, the groove or the vamp is sets up a structure for arcing over it. And I'll show you what I mean. Like the okay. one I was playing. Oh, this is off. Let me turn it on. The one that I was playing yesterday was um, kind of like a bossa nova. repeated and repeated so I actually looped it probably at a different tempo but so this is slower and it just keeps repeating mm -hmm. and what's what's beautiful about that to me is that when I set up the structure that I've got that loop, and I don't know how much you guys could hear of it, um, but I've got the loop going. I've got, I know that from here to here on my harp, I can play any note. And if you're playing on a keyboard, it's all the white keys of the piano. I set this up so that it's all in the key of C. So right. as long as you play single notes as if you were a flute, you can play anything. And if you keep doing it as a practice, it, it allows you to sink and sink and sink into this feeling of, um, of connection, of connection with the music. Rather than trying to get it right, it's, we've talked about this before, it is an opportunity to let it get to you. So this, for example, I mean, if people wanted to get this, um, the, I, have a, I have a project called Harp Time with DHC, mm -hmm. where I'm creating a bunch of these. And, and, and if you sign up for that and, and it's free, then you, you'll get this, you'll actually get the audio. So people can play along with it on piano or on harp or whatever. And there's a bunch of them and they're different. Like that one's got a rhythm, but then there's one. And, and I know how well you can hear this. They're just, they're structures mm -hmm. that allow to play along and the reason i'm bringing them up now is that i notice that it gives me great sense of calm and it seems to give all the people who do it a great sense of calm even if it's a you know even it's even if it's a really bouncy thing but the calm is beginning to trust that it's going to come around again you're going to be able to to dance on it mm -hmm. you're not going to be thrown off you know the whatever it is and why did i bring this up now because you were oh because you were talking about things that we can do each day mm -hmm. to 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 connect to our to our gravity and to help di get a distinction understand that distinction and i was thinking how can we also do this with music and having a groove is part of what does that for us and lets us make a practice out of it Absolutely. And I would say the groove is akin uh, psychologically to staying um, connected to the larger self. Again, right. that who I am in any given moment in time is so much more than the me I'm experiencing in the moment. So how <laughs> I'll say that again. I, yeah, yeah. That, that, the, that the getting in the groove is that sense of I'm always so much more than I'm experiencing in any given moment in time. That, so the scared me shows up, but there's so much more with me right now, even though I can't access it, than scared me. Right, right. There's, yeah. that, uh, there's that foundational rhythm, right. groove. It's the thing you can count on. That's it's right. It's there, whether you, and I just realized that when you're a beginning yeah player you often can't hear it because you're just you're right you're, you're only can hear the thing you're playing and i just realized that the practice 
is all about listening to the what to the underlying groove even while you're doing what you're doing so that you see where it fits you just gave a beautiful definition of what it means to have can be conscious of the ego self axis that at the same time the ego is doing something the ego is tuned into what's the underlying groove what's the bigger backscape what's the foundation here and so that the is same the ego, the ego is aware of that or the ego, the ego is aware oh, because oh you of, want the ego to be aware you want the ego to be aware of that because at any given time, there's so much more we know than the ego can consciously register in one moment in time. The ego, you know, is very much um, single-minded. It's hard for the ego, you know, it's like, it, it, it is um, like a little circle, whereas the larger self is the big circle that holds it all. <laughs> right. So the little yeah. circle, if, if the little circle is like a moon or something, it's like, I'm wobbling, I'm wobbling, I'm wobbling. Yeah, yes. Yeah. and you know yeah. and is not and is not being aware of that no matter how much i wobble my gravity is connected to them so that's how it works yes and you mentioned gravity several times so i just want to say i think that from my point of view and from jung's point of view and um for me from the point of view of western spiritual traditions the gravity that is important for us to have is a sense of self. That the idea that the ego is always the problem and we need to get rid of ego or not have a sense of self, I believe is problematic psychologically and spiritually because the ego or the sense of self we are grounds us in the present reality. And part of our work, as I can best tell it, and our play on this earth plane is to incarnate, is to live in to the totally body. Incarnate, right? Yeah. To, to incarnate, and, right, and yeah. so that we we need an ego. The problem is when the ego thinks it's in charge and that it's all that it is. Right. That's when the ego is problematic. So, yeah. So when you only can hear yourself and you can't hear the groove that's going on. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure as a musician, you've had experiences where somebody, you know, the diva who takes over and there isn't room for anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I've experienced that. <laughs> I do that sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I know, I, I think I understand from things we've talked about in these sessions, that in Jung, there is the collective as well the collective unconscious yes unconscious as well and i'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about that right now because you know we're in um you know we're in the middle of this pandemic so we're aware of this we're aware of how what we do impacts the the greater community right that's always true I mean, it's right. always true and we're not aware of it. So this is giving us an opportunity to become aware of it. Is, is that at all related to a sense of the collective unconscious or is it they're just two completely different things? Like being aware of where we fit in society. Like I, I don't, I don't want to get sick because I don't want to get sick, but I really don't want to get sick because that's going to then mean a hospital bed not available for somebody else. And you know, there's, there's an impact. Are these two completely different things than the collective unconscious? Well, what I would say you just described would be what we call collective consciousness. That the collective oh. consciousness right now is um, everybody stay home, don't get sick, don't, don't take a chance of being sick and then passing it. For the, one of the primary reasons you just said, our hospital system. Mm -hmm. Like um, not to the stress event. the system. Right. So that's an example of an attitude of collective consciousness. The collective unconscious is all of what's unknown that's driving these responses. And the collective unconscious we experience first and foremost up through our own body experience. And I would say the primitive or unconscious body sensations and um, emotional affective states that come out of nowhere and get us uh -huh. you know it's like you can be doing quote fine you're having a good day and then all of a sudden you watch a news clip and like high anxiety oh so the that, collective that's unconscious 
fear has activated your own fears and in your body. And so part of how we become an agent of change for the unconscious is we choose to deal with whatever comes up in us unbidden and unexpected. And by deal with, I mean, when my, um, when, when my fear comes up or my anger comes up or my rage or my indignation, whatever it is comes up, that I be willing to say, oh, wow, look at that interesting feeling. Where did that come from? What's that about? What does that mean about me? And if I can relate to it and bring it into the conference room of my heart, it begins to balance it and it has less power. This is how we become an agent of change for the collective psyche. If I can calm my fears about what's happening, then I become a resonance like the heart string, the resonance perhaps contributing to a groove that joins with other heart strings in the resonance. And now there's an option for people to respond to this out of a centered place instead of a fearful place. Wow. So if when, when a fear comes up from the collective unconsciousness, mm -hmm. if I don't react to it right. meaning literally act or talk or speak or whatever react to it but instead bring it into the conference room of my soul yeah and open it up for discussion yeah in a calm way while playing a nice groove on my harp yes or, or, or <laughs> i mean or figuratively playing a yeah. nice on my harp meaning just playing something that is continuous yeah. and and in connection with um with the the lower rhythm rather than oh my god then i become part of where that can get worked out yes yes uh-huh yeah and i firmly believe that that this is an opportunity for those of us who choose to respond that way to help there be a collective shift in consciousness to where we are more compassionate with ourselves and one another, and that thus everybody gets a better quality of life as a result. That's, that's beautiful. So what I hear you saying is that, or what, is that crisis, a crisis like this, or any crisis, mm -hmm. can um, help us, help um, shine a light mm -hmm. on how we want to be all the time and it can actually in a sense it's like a gym you know it's like yeah. it, it 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 pushes us it gives us the chance to push ourselves further so that when the crisis is over if we have these i keep coming back to these uh, observation of systems in my mm -hmm. own life and so that when, if we create systems or strengths during this time they will support us in lifting everything that's right afterwards that's right and, and it sounds like you're saying, you know, this is a, this is a, a worldwide crisis that, that we're doing it in, and it can show us how we can do it in every moment, in every year of our lives, all the time. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And it then becomes a practice. You know, one of the strings of passions we've right. been talking about is the, the stream of practice and practices. And so it becomes a practice that if we begin... At, in the non-crisis moments to be open to whatever comes up, then we've built the psychic spiritual muscle of doing that in the crisis. Right. But if we haven't been doing that, then the crisis really says, okay, we got to go to the gym. Right. <laughs> we got to start lifting the right. muscle. It's kind of like the practices with the heart of like dropping into the groove right. of giving up the idea that there's one right note or chord right. over top of the groove that we let ourselves begin to experiment. And oh, so that as when we hear the groove and can, can trust it, then, and we're in, we've got that deep in us, then we can experiment over it. Not, yeah. not worrying about where we're going to wobble. Huh? Exactly. And the same thing psychologically and spiritually, that if we begin this practice of inviting whatever state of consciousness comes up with a strong emotion or affect or fantasy images that run away with us or beliefs or thoughts into the conference room of our heart, hear what it has to say, let the other parts of us respond because they'll show up. 
believe me, the, the, this, these parts of us don't, you know, we got lots of voices that want to be heard, don't we? I do. Yeah. <laughs> Conference room party, everyone. Yeah, and, and when we do that, then, then something organic begins to happen. And so if we develop that practice, just like I know from my own experience, if I let myself improv with the grooves, what I do now is very different than what I did a year and a half ago because I've developed the muscle of relaxing, listening to <laughs> right. and responding and experimenting. Right. And knowing that whatever you're doing is okay so that you're not reacting to that. Absolutely. Okay. So let's come back to my very first question because I have a feeling this is going to help answer that. Okay. And my, my first question was about how do I go in a straight line? And you said, well, that may not be what you want to do. Or, and there are many different straight lines in different realities mm -hmm. in a curved world, which we have apparently a curve is okay. a straight line. How, um, can you just put into words, I mean, I know that I can, I know, I know that each thing, like if I can't find my earbuds, that is a crisis in the moment. That crisis can either become, oh, just solve the crisis, or it can become, aha, thank you. This needs a system. Mm -hmm. Let's create a system. I'm seeing that that can become a beautiful dance for me right now in, in terms of creating a foundation for myself of greater functionality, greater fluency, greater flow. Um, what, is there anything else or is that really just it? Well, I think, I think it's just it and that if we discern where do we need the straight line and where would that be life giving and where do we need the arc, the circle? So for instance, the earbuds, or I'm thinking about having things in my kitchen in place because right. I love to cook. So I want to spend more time cooking than I spend looking for the utensils I need. Or exactly. The yeah. So if they go back in the same place every time, then I get to have more time for that art line of experimenting with cooking. The same thing with our heart, for instance. I know one of the things you talk about early on in one of your courses is setting up, I don't think you call it the learning environment, but no, you know, yeah, creating conducive conditions. There you go. So, so you create conducive can go, yeah, conditions. Right. Yeah, so the harp is there, the stand is there, the music, the tuner, all of those things are right there because if I've got 30 minutes to play harp, I don't want to spend 10 minutes getting everything I need together. If I have it already together in a conducive environment, a conducive condition. So what we might say might be kind of um, a rule of thumb or an intention about where do we set up the straight line and where do we go with the flow of the arc is, is, is this going to let me do more of the thing that's life giving? So what's the difference between the arc and the straight line? That the straight line is very, linear and it's this way or no way whereas the arc has lots of possibilities and so when would i actually use a straight line when you want to know where your earbuds are uh, or when you want to know where the utensils are in the kitchen okay so that's an orientation that is right. like knowing exactly the orientation of everything to me right. so i can reach out and play it so like when i learn the orientation of my strings right. so that i can play without looking and I want to have that straight line orientation so I can have a curved line of, of being able to respond in time. Is that right? Well, because then you've set up a foundation or structures to support you in moving out into the curve where there are more possibilities, where there can be an expansion of self. It's like the two are necessary. They support one another. So how would I go from knowing where my earbuds are, which is a straight line, to a curved line. What, how well, would... I don't know that you ever need to with where your earbuds are. Oh, okay. W yeah. Well, well, let me ask with you. With the exception, yeah, with the okay. exception that when I'm in the house, my earbuds stay one place, and when I'm in the office, my earbuds ah, stay there. Ah, okay, great. So if we do set up some a straight line, earbuds are always up there, then, like I did that with my keys. My keys always go by the front door. Yeah. Well, when I'm traveling, 
I need a new rule. I need, uh, you know, it always goes in the front pouch of my fanny pack, but, but it's still, it's different. It's more flexible. So is there, I just want to make sure I understand this. So my earbuds are always in one place. That's a straight line. I want to have my earbuds for, so when I go running, I can listen to an audio book. Right. Is that where I take the straight line and put it into a curve? Or am I? Well, you may never need to put the straight line of where the earbuds are in a curve. It okay. may always need to be a straight line. Okay. All right. Where With the I'm... exception that <laughs> right. the relationship to the earbuds, like again, there might begin to be an arc in that my relate the earbuds are one place in the house and one place in the office. So then we start to have a little bit of a curved relationship. But in truth, Deborah, there are times in terms of what we're talking about that things just need to stay in their proper place, so to speak. That just right, right. But there are times like, like my hand needs right. to stay on the it, end of my arm, basically. Right, right. But there are other times and and things that we want to do that that the perception that we need to move is in a straight line is actually what becomes the obstacle. <laughs> See, okay. we're kind of expanding now what we've been talking about. In right. that but this is great. Gonna, I love that I'm confused. So give yeah. me an example, another example of a curved line, just one more. Well, for instance, when you improv, if you believe there's only one way to improv, you've got a straight line that's an obstacle to improv -ing. This is, I understand it to be every classical musician's block to doing improv. Oh, because it's got to right, be a straight they, line a certain way. Because they have seen it on the page, and to right. them, that page is the music. Right. And to me, the music is some wild, you know, live animal with a heartbeat that changes. Right. And right, so to improv, the straight line is an obstacle. But to improv, the center that's connected to the arc where there are lots of possibilities and lots of ways to stay connected to that oh. point is what's needed. Right. Okay. If you're going to play a classical piece of music with a symphony, then there probably needs to be a straight line of how you play. So some, and then, and then depending on how I write it, I might make a space for that open line. Right. All right. So, so what I'm going to do based on this, since I don't totally understand it yet, but I love it. <laughs> and I started out with the question, you know, how do I get from point A to point B in a more mm -hmm. fluent way is I'm going to start looking at just looking at that idea. What, uh, and let me just say that a curve, a, the curve is a locus of a point with one degree of freedom. Okay. That, that happens to be the definition of a curve. And I only know that because I wrote a piece called Stress Analysis of a Strapless Evening Gown, where I took mathematical terms and I wrote, made music out of them. And, and the most beautiful one to me was the, the concept of curve, you know, um, uh, because with one degree of freedom, the point becomes a curve. That's how it ha I think that's beautiful. the definition. And, um, and so I, <laughs> I guess I just want to be, I guess what I want to start doing is looking for when the, the straight line creates a structure and looking for where I need that one degree of freedom mm -hmm. so that I can have the point become a curve or, this, or the line become a curve. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think, again, psychologically, when we make room for all parts of ourselves, all of our emotions, all of our fantasies, even crazy ones, we make room for them to be in the conference room of our heart. We've gone with that one degree of freedom from the point. And there's an expansion of self that happens just like an expansion of music that happens. Oh, that I can understand. Mm -hmm. That when you keep playing the same piece over time, with the concept of freedom and understanding it more and playing it with others and then it will expand. You don't have to expand it. It will expand you. Right. Well, thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome. I think we've come full circle here today. I think we have. Thank you so much. I really, I really love these sessions and I look forward 
to the next one. Terrific. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks so much. Bye-bye.